Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. I appreciate uh, Brother Jerry selecting songs that uh, go along with our topic that we're addressing uh, at this time. Uh, is life worth living? This is the question that was put forth by 19th century philosopher William James. You see, you have the period of time between birth and death. While it is a time that has certainly laughter and joy, it is also a time that is filled with heartache, pain, tears. And all of these things are what might be said to be the price of living. And it might be wondered whether all these trials are worth it. Are they worth living? Well, the Apostle Paul, as he knew that death lay very shortly ahead for him, he was able to look back at a life worth living. He said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 and 7. So Paul spoke about this life that is worth living. And let's examine that a little more closely and know that a life worth living can be had by any of us. Let's break down what Paul said and first let us note a fight worth fighting. Now if we are decent, decent people, we desire peace. I mean, we don't think highly about somebody who's always going out looking for a fight, with, you know, looking to pick fights with anybody. If we're decent people, we desire peace. And much more so is that the case if we are Christians. As we read in Romans 12 and verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And so, live peaceably with, with everybody. That is a goal, that is desi a desire of each of us. As we read in Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men. Just the way a hunter pursuing his quarry is following that quarry. We are following peace. We desire that peace. But at the same time, there comes a point. There have come various times when a fight must be fought. That is certainly true with regard to physical military warfare. President Kennedy said that the United States, quote, will oppose any foe to ensure the survival and success of liberty. Now, as the government is entrusted with the judicial sword, according to Romans 13 and verse 4, it is likewise entrusted with the military sword, and there are times in which that must be utilized. Even the wise man Solomon observed that there is a time for war. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 8. Well, if there is a time for physical warfare, there is certainly a time for spiritual warfare. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, said, I came not to send peace, but a sword, Matthew 10, 34. Now, he did come to bring a certain kind of peace, but there would be conflict that would accompany his teachings because it was coming to a certain kind of domain. Now, then there is a fight that we must fight. But a question that we might ask is, how can we be sure if the fight that we are faced with if the fight in which we're considering engaging is truly a good fight. And many times we will admit it is difficult to know. We think back to when the United States went to war with Iraq. And, and I, you know, it, different people stand on different sides. Should we have, should we not? Uh, but one of the reasons for going to war was based at least partly on faulty intelligence. There was some wrong information that said we need to go to war for this reason when that actual reason was not exactly correct. But the thing is, we do not need to worry about having faulty intelligence if our source is God. 
We already noticed that God's thoughts are infinitely higher than any human thoughts. As it said in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 25, for the foolishness of God, that is what man might perceive to be foolishness, the foolishness of God is wiser than man. Any wisdom of man, whatever God has to say, is far and infinitely wiser. And so if God tells us that there is a time for war, there is a time for battle, and this is the time, it's going to be correct. Now by inspiration of God, Paul said, I have fought a good fight. That's what he had done. And in 1 Timothy 1.18, we read, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them might have swore a good warfare. There is a good warfare to fight. There is a good fight that he had fought, as is spoken of in chapter 6 and verse 12 of that same book. And so there is this good fight. Well, who is then the foe in this good fight? We think about World War II, and that is one of the occasions in which we can look back at history and see that there was clearly a good guy and there was a bad guy. And Winston Churchill spoke of the foe whom the British were facing in World War II and described it this way, a monstrous tyranny never surpassed the dark, lamentable catalog of human crime. Never surpassed. Well, we're told that we're to stand in the evil day. And we're told that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. And so we're warring against demonic powers. We're warring against Satan. Literally, the adversary. He is the one who is constantly at battle with God, with your Creator. That's who he is warring against. He is warring against each one of us. He opposes us. He opposes our salvation. He does not want any of us to spend eternity with God. He wants to stop that from happening. It is also called the devil. Literally, the accuser or the slanderer. In the book of Job, we're introduced to some of those slanders that, Job sought to, that uh, Satan sought to bring against Job. You know, he only serves you from ulterior motives. Not only was he slandering Job, then he was really slandering God. Saying, you're not worthy of that kind of service. You're not worthy of anybody serving you. He's a liar. He's a slanderer. Friends, that is our foe. And we think about our cause. What is the cause? Jesus Christ had a cause that compelled him to leave what he had in heaven. Caused him to leave the presence of the Father. You know, once we're there, I assure you, that is a place we will never, ever want to leave. But he did. Why? The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10 he saw souls that were lost and would not go to be with the Father, would not go to be in that place, and he was going to do something about it. He was going to do everything possible, and he did. He came and preached. He came and gave a gospel. He came and inaugurated that gospel and purchased the part of every man and woman with his blood upon that cross. And we are now charged with a commission. As initially said to the apostles and passed on to the church, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And so the salvation or condemnation of human souls lies in our action or inaction, as the case may be. Are we going to engage this battle as our Lord Jesus Christ engaged as is said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, as it's spoken about the fact that we have Scripture, we have a powerful word, an all-sufficient word. He went on to say, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. 
be instant. That is, be urgent. In season, out of season. At times when they want to hear it, when times when they're eager and thirsting and hunger for the word, be urgent. But also out of season. Might be times it seems like people are interested. You do the same. It's still God's word. It still has that same power. You be urgent with it. Because souls lie in the balance. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap of themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. Thou therefore endure hardness as a soldier of Jesus Christ. We endure hardness. We're to do the work of an evangelist. We're to do the work of those who are saving souls. That is the cause that we have. And we think about the spoils. You go through history. You look at the Old Testament. And you look at the battles that they waged. And there were spoils that were to be gained. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. He went on to say, henceforth, verse 8 of 2 Timothy 4, Henceforth there is laid for me a crown of righteousness. That's the spoils. A crown of righteousness. Having lived a righteous life, having spent his life fighting for the cause of righteousness, Paul could stand on the day of judgment, even as one who in times past had sinned terribly, but he could stand crowned as one as if he had never sinned. That is the crown of righteousness. Elsewhere we find that same crown spoken of as a crown of glory. 1 Peter 5 and verse 4. James 1 and verse 2 is spoken of as a crown of life. And so those who fight this fight, they look forward to this crown of righteousness and of glory and of life everlasting. And for Paul, he was imprisoned by Caesar. He, he was about to be executed. He said, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. Even what looked at that time to be a devastating loss, even that was going to be a resounding victory. In that life worth living, we see a fight worth fighting. But he also said, I've finished my course. There is a course worth finishing. Many times in the Bible, or at least more than once in the scriptures, we find the Christian life compared to running a race. For example, in Hebrews 12, 1, let us run with patience or let us run with endurance. The race that is set before us. So it's a, a long race that we have ahead of us, and so let us run it with endurance. Or as 1 Corinthians 9.23 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, so run that you may obtain. So just as they run, you are running. You are running in this course. And that is the comparison that is made at that time. Something arduous. Something with a goal at the end of it but something that we must labor through at this time to get there. Now, there may be a physical race being run where the price paid is too high relative to the prize that may or may not be received at the end of it. Again, no, you're not the way they were run a race or all, but one receives the prize. Only one person is getting that first place. Now, I know some places, you know, you get the second place, you know, you get the silver, you get the bronze. And so you might say, well, three get a prize. But, but again, at this time, just one got the prize. They didn't care about second. They didn't care about third. One received the prize, and that was it. And so you think about that prize. And so you're on this race, but perhaps an injury might be sustained along the way. That continuing in the race would only make that injury worse. Is a lifetime debilitating injury worth continuing in the race to get that prize? You're talking about maybe a laurel wreath? Um, maybe not. Perhaps the conditions on that course are so bad that injuries are inevitable. You're probably familiar with the kind of sports 
uh, that the Romans liked to endure, go through in that time. You know, Ben-Hur and that kind of thing where a lot of injuries were inevitable. And that may have been the case for some of the races that people would run. And also, you might think about something else. In a race, there might be a time when somebody might actually want to ease up in the course of a race to allow a teammate to win the prize rather than oneself. I don't know how much that happened in ancient times, but I've seen such things happening today, and that's certainly commendable. But you think about the Christian course. We noted what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. He said you need to run this course. You need to enter in that straight gate. Now he said there's that other way. Wide gate. Broad is the way. It leads to destruction. But it's nice and easy to travel. But straight is the gate. Narrow is the way that leads to life. It's much more difficult to travel this way. But, but that's the Christian course in which one needs to engage. And in a sense, injuries are perhaps inevitable. That's why we do need to endure hardness. But as one runs and perseveres on the Christian course, the injuries he sustains do not increasingly worsen as he goes. As a matter of fact, they heal and he becomes stronger. As you continue on that course, those injuries heal and become stronger. That's why James was able to say, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, all these manifold different trials. Count it all joy. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. When your faith is tried, you're going to become stronger at the end of it if you continue on the course. And, you know, we mentioned one might ease up in a race to allow somebody else to win. But in this course, the competition is not between Christians in the sense that if one wins, anybody else is excluded. Yes, know you not that they which run in a physical race run all but one receive the prize, so they which uh, so run that you may obtain. But he goes on to say, but they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And every one of us, we, not just one of you singularly, not just me, but all of us can obtain this, every single last one. And there is no comparison with regard to the crown. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Again, a laurel wreath. A laurel crown be placed upon them. One that the leaves would eventually fall off. It would decay. It would decompose. There wouldn't be anything left of it. But what about what we're receiving? An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. And that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. You are comparing a laurel wreath with a crown of righteousness. Friend, that is no comparison at all. We read in Hebrews 4, verses 9 and following, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Folks, that rest isn't for this life. That rest is in the life to come. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And so we push on. We persevere through this course. And so let us be certain that we are on that right course. We've entered in the right gate. And that we finish the course. This is a course worth finishing. And Paul also spoke about a faith worth keeping. You'll hear it referred today as somebody being a person of faith. People people talk about the different faiths that are in existence in our community or in our country. And they'll talk about the Buddhist faith, the Muslim faith, the Jewish faith, all these different faiths. But it needs to be considered that not all faiths are equal. And I'm not talking about my personal preferences. I'm talking about what our Creator has had to say about the matter. Not all faiths are equal. In Jude 3, 
Jude wrote, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to run to you with the common salvation, it was needful for me to run unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Well, there's that fight worth fighting. Earnestly contend. But why? What's that cause? You contend for the faith. You contend for the gospel, that system of faith that comes from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that comes by the inspiration of God. You earnestly contend for this. Paul said to the apostle Peter, as Peter had fallen into a transgression, he said, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, Galatians 2.16, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now that's kind of a tongue twister mouthful right there. But to break it down, the law, the works of the law, even though the law, the Old Testament was given by God, we're not going to be justified by it. We're not going to stand approved before God on the judgment day because we've kept the Old Testament. It's only by the faith, the system of faith of Jesus Christ. As we read in Romans 1 and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, the power, not a power, the power of God of salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so from faith, from the system of faith, from the gospel to faith, our personal faith, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that's how we're going to be justified. This is that faith worth keeping. Jesus came to give this faith. He came to save mankind. And there was a body in which the saved would be found. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I'm going to die, Jesus said, but that's not going to prevent me from establishing my church. As a matter of fact, that death that I'm going to undergo, in all its humiliation, in all its excruciation, it's going to enable me to purchase the salvation, the redemption of this church. That is a church worth being part of. It's built upon a solid foundation. Another foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. Now Jesus Christ built his church that he promised he would. That is the faith. That is the church. We find in Ephesians 4 verses 4 through 6, there is one body, which is the church, Ephesians 1, 23 and 24, or 22 and 23, and there is one faith. The faith. The faith of Jesus Christ. Now we find a lot of faiths today. Even some which profess allegiance to Jesus Christ. But as Paul warned, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. And so there are those who have departed from this faith. They continue to profess faith in Jesus Christ, but they're not part of the faith. As we read in 2 Peter 2 and verse 1, we have the Scripture. We have God's Word just as those Old Testament folks, the Israelites, they had the prophets. But Peter went on to say, but there were false prophets also among the people. Even though they had the scriptures, there were false prophets among them, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privilege shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Remember, some shall depart from the faith. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. And that's what we in large part have today. And so we have all these different faiths, but are not part of the faith. I mentioned a quote from William James earlier. Let me just mention another one that he stated. He said, Believe that life is worth living, and your belief will help create the fact. Okay, I won't deny the power 
of positive thinking. It's good to have a positive attitude. But the thing is, your belief doesn't have to help create the fact when your belief is actually the truth. It is the fact. It doesn't need to be made the fact. And that is what the faith is. And Paul, we are told, had kept the faith. This is what I've done. I have kept the faith. Now, keeping, in this, particularly in the original language, it can have a few different senses. It can have the idea of to keep watch over or to guard. You know, just like a, a keep. We think about keeping people in, in, within it. Or we think about a watch. We think that one might, one might keep uh, prisoners. Also, keep can mean to cause a state, condition, or activity to continue. And so we might think about the idea of preserving. You know, was that going to keep? You know, you have lettuce or you have salad. Somebody was talking about eating last night. Is that going to keep? We well, have to do things to make sure that is kept. And also it can have the idea, the word keep, can have the idea to persist in obedience. So we think about it with regard to keep commandments. Because we have these three senses. In all of these ways, we do need to keep the faith. We need to guard the faith of Jesus Christ from the bevy of assaults being made against it. As Paul spoke about the fact that he was to war a good warfare, he went on and said in 1 Timothy 1, verses 19 and following, holding faith, or holding the faith, holding on to it tightly, and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And so there was war being made against individuals such as this. They had made shipwreck of the faith, the one true faith, and so he was going to guard it. He was going to do what he could. As instructions were being given to ordain elders, and the qualifications were set forth for what those elders need to be able to do. It said of them that they need to be holding fast the faithful, faithful word as he hath been taught. He needs to be holding fast that faithful word because he needs to guard that faith. Because he goes on to say, there are un many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of circumcision, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. Now we might be facing different false doctrines today. And perhaps they may be motivated, motivated by filthy lucre. Maybe they are not. But they're still subverting whole houses. Those that were houses of God are being uprooted by these false doctrines. We need to defend the faith from these assaults. Elders, especially, have failed in their duty so many times in the church. But each of us has a responsibility earnestly to contend for the faith. We need to pay careful attention as well that we observe the faith, that we persist in obedience to it. As Paul spoke about the apostleship that he received, he said he received it for obedience to the faith among all nations. Romans 1 and verse 5. We obey the faith. We obey the gospel. And as Paul said, I have fought. I have finished. I have kept. Uh, the tense in which all of these appear is in the perfect tense. Now, without going into a, to a big grammar lesson, let me just say, this the places the emphasis on the present resultant condition more than on those past events. Where do I stand now presently because of what I've done in the past? And this is where he stood. During our time on earth, we can only find true meaning in life and true value in life if we are keeping the faith of Jesus Christ. Solomon, that wise one, try to find meaning in all those different ways as you go through the book of Ecclesiastes and wasted so many years, wasted decades of his life. He had wasted those years of his youth and finally in his age state, he said, 
Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Don't waste those years you have now. And he went on to say, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Now if you're looking in your King James Version, you'll see that duty is italicized. That is, it's not originally in the text. That was supplied by the translators to help convey the meaning that the translators believed was the meaning. But take that out. What then does it say? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. This is everything. This is our reason for being. This is what gives our lives true meaning. And we may not appreciate that all the time. Maybe we don't appreciate that at all. We need to. Because the true value of keeping the faith will be seen after our time on earth is done. Paul went on to say, because I've done these things, he said, henceforth there is laid up for me, 2 Timothy 4.8, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, at the day of judgment. Now, again, Paul had already stood before the judgment seat of Caesar. And he said, at my first defense, no man stood with me. Nobody was there to help me at that time. Nobody was on my side. The Lord stood with me. Nobody else did. And he knew what he's going to receive this next time. Off with his head was what was going to be the sentence. He knew this. But he's now turning from the judgment of men, the fallible and wrong and false judgment of men, to the righteous judgment of God. The Lord, the righteous judge, is going to give me something else at that day. I may be losing my head at this judge, but that good judge, the righteous judge, is going to place something glorious upon my head. The righteous judge will not bestow reward or punishment in an arbitrary manner, no man or woman will be admitted to heaven who has not lived according to the Christian faith. That sounds fairly plain, but it is. It, 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 our God is plain with us. As Jesus Christ said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. We will each be judged by the words of of Jesus Christ. And so we will not be admitted if we fail to keep the faith. But at the same time, no man or woman will be excluded from heaven who has faithfully kept the faith. He is the righteous judge. He, as Paul went on to say, not to me only. That, that judgment is only for me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And those who keep the faith are those who truly love His appearing. They're seeking that which is greater. They're seeking that which is right. They're seeking the things which belong and pertain to Jesus Christ. You see, the Christian does not need to fear the words off with his head coming from the lips of the most powerful man on earth. The Christian needs fear no condemnation of man when he knows he will hear the Lord's commendation, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In a sense, there is a price paid for our lives, the time we live here, and that each one of us suffers trials, every one of us. The Lord also blesses us with innumerable joys in our life. Each one of us can count our blessings and every good and perfect gift comes from Him, James 1 and verse 17. But our only hope for eternal bliss is to pass through our time here having fought the good fight, having finished the course, and having kept the faith. As we have seen this afternoon, there is a measurable value in seeing that we do exactly this. Now, if there is immeasurable value to be seen and the very price that we pay for our living, 
There could be no question that such a life is a life worth living. When William James asked the question, is life worth living? The answer that he gave was, it depends on the liver. Well, ultimately, it does not matter who the liver of the life is. He or she has the opportunity to have a life worth living. Jesus said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And so, the baggage of sin and poor choices, Jesus Christ says, I'll take that from you. The baggage of living years away from Christ, He says, I'll take that away from you. The baggage of knowing that we have only condemnation ahead of us when life is over. Jesus says, I'll take that from you and replace it with life eternal. It does not matter who the liver is, but what does matter is the life itself. Is it the Christian life? We find it being said in Revelation 14 and verse 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And so if we die in the Lord, we are blessed. But we then need to make sure that we are in the Lord. Romans 6 verses 3 and following read, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we bear with Him by baptism into death, that like as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That perfect life, that good life, that life worth living we enter into when we're baptized into what? Into Jesus Christ. That's when we begin to fight that good fight. That's when we begin that course worth finishing. That's when we begin to be keepers of that faith worth keeping. And so this afternoon, if you've not begun to live this life, we'd urge you and we'd plead with you to do this, to come to the faith of Jesus Christ. Do you know, do you understand, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you understand this, this gives you the right to become a child of God. John 1 and verse 12. Well, you then need to exercise that right as you repent of your sins, as you confess the name of Jesus Christ, and as you are baptized. As Peter said on the day of Pentecost, when the church of Jesus Christ was established, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Right now, friend, the gospel call is going out to each one of us. Are you going to respond? Do you have the need to respond? If so, please come forward now as together we stand and sing the selected song of invitation.